In that New Testament passage that I just read, Paul tells the Corinthians to be in agreement and let there be no divisions among you, but be united in the same mind and the same purpose. When I read that, I think, wait a minute. Are we really all supposed to be exactly the same? Are we really supposed to never disagree on anything? I've been told ever since I can remember to be yourself, that individuality is a good thing, that God made each of us unique, like a snowflake. To say that we need to all be alike seems wrong. And it is, actually. That's not at all what Paul is saying here. What Paul is talking about are tags, tags that describe us, some we choose and some that are chosen for us. And the problem for Paul is that the Corinthians are getting lost in all the tags and forgetting what actually does define them. We live in a culture that often tries to reduce us to a simple idea, a single tag that defines us. We see that most clearly in the political realm where you're often either a conservative or a liberal, yet most people are not absolutely either. Most of us tend to be conservative on some issues and liberal on others and generally a mix of things across the board. But it takes more effort to explain a nuanced position like that and nuance is something we don't always take a lot of time with. So we reduce people to simple tags. It's easier. It's also lazy. People are actually a gooey mixture of complex and diverse traits and abilities and beliefs and preferences. You can't reduce them to one single defining characteristic. Like a rack of sweaters in a department store, we all have tags. And to understand who someone is, you have to read all their tags, not just one. Now, my son Harry hates tags. Whenever we put a new shirt on him that has a tag in the neck, he always asks for scissors so he can cut it out. And I can understand. I've had new shirts that when I put them on, it felt like the tag was made out of porcupines and sewn in with barbed wire. (laughs) But there's a reason why clothes have tags. Tags contain important information about the garment, what it's made of, and how to take care of it. I saw a tag in a sweater once that included the usual care and washing instructions, machine wash warm, do not bleach, dry flat. But then at the bottom it said, or give it to your mother. She knows how to do it. (laughs) And this is, I actually saw a guy in a store once who had pulled the waistband of his briefs up and was twisted around trying to see it so that he could read the size off of it and know what size to buy. Tags can be irritating, but they can also be helpful. We wear them proudly as things that distinguish us and make us different from everyone else. Our tags identify our strengths and weaknesses, our likes and dislikes, the groups to which we belong, and the myriad of personality characteristics that we possess. Sometimes we choose our own tags, as when we proudly wear our school colors or the logos of our favorite sports teams, There are lots of people this morning sporting a Buckeye tag around here, but if you look closely, you'll probably see a few Bobcats, a Wolverine or two, and maybe even a Gamecock. We call ourselves Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or Independent. We are omnivores or vegetarians or vegans. We're cat people or dog people. We're comfortable with technology or not so much. We are teens or tweens or Gen Xers or baby boomers or any number of other generational tags. We wear racial tags and gender tags and tags related to our profession, our education, our socioeconomic status. Some tags we choose, some are assigned. Some we proudly wear and others we try to hide or avoid. And those tags, for better or worse, help others to understand a little bit about who we are. When I was in the seventh grade, I had to fill out a form at school that asked me to list my race. In a spirit of youthful rebellion, I put down human. (laughs) The next day, an administrator came to our classroom and called my name. And when I raised my hand, he looked at me and looked down at his paper and made a little mark and said, thank you, and left the room. (laughs) All he did was look at my face and check a box. He needed a tag for me, and the one that I had given him wasn't quite specific enough. The variety of tags we wear says something about the rich diversity of God's creation. There's a great line in the movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, where a little Caucasian girl asks Morgan Freeman, who is African-American, 
did God paint you? And Freeman replies, it is for certain. When the little girl asks him why, he says, because God loves wondrous variety. I love that line. God loves wondrous variety. Some of our tags are shared by others. Some are ours alone. And taken together, all our tags make us unique. But here's the thing. Our tags distinguish us, but they do not define us. Our tags that catalog our beliefs and preferences and abilities, our strengths and even our weaknesses and our shortcomings and our fears, these may distinguish us from one another. These may be the things that show how we are alike and how we are dissimilar, but they do not ultimately define who we are. We are defined by our identity as children of God. We are defined by the fact that God loves us enough to suffer all the worst that the human race has to offer, even death by cruel execution, just to walk in our footsteps, to live as one of us, to experience the depth and breadth of human experience, and to save us from ourselves. We are defined by God's willingness to love and forgive and accept us, not because of who we are and what we do, but in spite of it. We are defined by our connection to God through Jesus Christ. As author Richard Hayes writes, any attempt by the community to define itself in other terms will promote schism in the church and make our actions into a ridiculous parody of the faith we confess. And that's important to remember when we have a difficult time understanding people who wear different tags than ours, whether that's political parties or college football teams or denominational identities. It's true even in this congregation. We do, we hold differing opinions on money and how to spend it. We hold differing opinions about our property and how to be good stewards of it. We hold differing opinions of our staff and our program offerings and our mission efforts. We even have differing opinions about what constitutes effective worship. Yes, I've seen us define ourselves as being either traditional worship people or contemporary worship people. And what we hear Paul saying here is that while our beliefs and preferences are valid, they do not ultimately define us. Therefore, they should not dictate how we treat one another and how we come to the tasks of worship and discipleship. As much as Paul urges the Corinthians to be united in the same mind and purpose, he's not insinuating that everyone must agree on every issue. God has given us minds to analyze and question, to critique and explore, it's difficult to believe that God would expect us to not use those minds in the practice of our faith. Of course, we'll ask difficult questions and come out in different places. Of course, we'll believe differently on tough issues like the Israeli-Palestine conflict and gay marriage and whether or not there should be a restaurant on the corner across the street from our church. And the positions we take on those issues and the positions we take on those issues and more can become tags that distinguish us as being like some and different from others, but they do not, and they cannot, and they will not define us. We are all children of God, and that is the tag that ultimately matters. So to God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come. Amen. <laughs>